All right. So we will be talking about, uh, as the title says, evolution of the Ethereum infrastructure. And just a small disclaimer that uh, this will be a, a pretty bit dumbed down version of uh, how the space has evolved or how the Ethereum ecosystem has evolved. So a lot of you probably must already know whatever you will see on this, but let's uh, try to enjoy it or let's try to see it from a different perspective or different point of view. So before starting the presentation, let me introduce myself. So Shao Belgrade, I'm Sahil Sen, and I work as a senior developer advocate at QuickNode, which is a, a developer platform, tooling pl provider, infrastructure provider, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we provide a lot of uh, tools and APIs to make development in Web3 on different, different chains easier from uh, Core API, which is RPC and REST APIs for interaction to blockchain networks, then streams, which is uh, ETL project, uh, ETL tooling for blockchains, then storages, which is IPFS, etc. So, if you want to connect with me, I'm S A N S H I L S I L on Twitter. And uh, now let's start. So Ethereum, from the beginning, in the beginning, it started as a platform to provide developers or to provide basically anyone to deploy applications on blockchain or decentralized applications on blockchains. Uh, completely different from Bitcoin, which was just mean, meant for financial applications, Ethereum envisioned it to become a platform for decentralized applications, right? So in the early days, it was just about nodes. Everyone who wanted to interact with the network, it was just via full nodes. So people who wanted to interact with the network, let's say wanted to deploy contracts, wanted to interact with those contracts, or wanted to get the blockchain data, they would have to run their own nodes. And then to run their own nodes, they would have to sync the entire blockchain data on the nodes. And then once that's done, then and then they would be able to interact with that node. So let's take this with the help of, or let's understand this with the help of an analogy. So let's uh, consider Ethereum as this uh, new and emerging small town where uh, things are done somewhat different and people are liking it, people are starting to move. And uh, once people start liking it, it starts getting crowded, right? A lot of people starts getting into the crowd, a lot of people starts living into the crowd, and uh, it, started, it starts getting crowded. And once a town starts getting crowded, once the population increases, it kind of becomes overwhelming on the town, right? It, uh, kind of puts burden on the services of the town. And that's what happened with the Ethereum network as well. Since it started gaining more popularity, it started uh, getting used a lot more. A lot of projects were getting deployed. A lot of projects were getting built on top of Ethereum. So that resulted into high transaction volume. And because of the high transaction volume, the block space become kind of expensive because everyone wanted to land their transactions in that particular block or within that block. So because of that, the gas fees started increasing. And because of the gas fees started increasing, the network kind of became very difficult to use and, had, and started having scalability issues. Just like how a town gets overwhelmed when a lot of people starts moving into it, it's just like any other big city. So, and the transaction speeds also started getting uh, slower because someone who can just uh, increase the gas, place their transaction in front of you, and uh, your transaction will take more time compared to their transaction. Because since they have more gas fees sent with the transaction, theirs will get accepted quicker than yours. And uh, on top of that, another big issue, or not issue, but another big thing was happening, which was expanding block data. Because the transactions were increasing, a lot of people were using it, the block data started increasing and the entire chain's data started increasing. So at this point, it was um, not feasible for people who were earlier running their own nodes to interact with the blockchain network to do read and write operations. At this point, it was not feasible for them. I mean, it was still doable. It's, it's doable right now as well, but people don't do that, right? Because it's not feasible. They just focus on their applications and uh, offload the infrastructure part or offload the tooling part to others. So at this point, a lot of node providers like uh, QuickNode, Alchemy, Infura started coming in, and uh, people started using these to 
interact with the blockchain networks. And uh, we were still having the scalability issues. So to solve that, there were some scalability solutions. And uh, these solutions you can assume as, or you can think of them as these satellite towns, which uh, every big city has, right? These satellite towns getting developed near the Ethereum city. So what these towns does is the, they help in offloading some burden from the main city to these satellite cities. Now, some solutions like side chains, they adhere or they copy the model of how the Ethereum city works, but they do not have to do anything with the Ethereum city. They just copy the model and then form their own city. But uh, uh, but solutions like rollups, what they do is they, yes, first copy the model of uh, the main Ethereum city, then does some changes to make their city better, and then they also send, just like, how, just like how a country works, right? Each and every state and each and every city still has their own operations, still has their own government, but they work on terms of the federal government or the national government. So that's how rollups works or the rollups used to do. They, uh, they have their own government, they have their own working, but they still has something to do with the main Ethereum network. They still send their data or roll up their data to the main Ethereum network. But there's some issue with this as well. I mean, we are seeing uh, even these uh, roll up solutions like uh, Optimism, Arbitrum 1, and uh, ZK Sync. ZK Sync is still not uh, that much overwhelmed now, but uh, Arbitrum, uh, Arbitrum and Optimistic, even these chains have started to get. Uh, overwhelmed, started to get more expensive if the number of transactions are so high. For example, for a use case like gaming, where there are so many transactions, and uh, if people were to use the Optimism mainnet or Arbitrum mainnet for their use cases for, let's say, gaming, or even FinTech, where high-frequency tra uh, high trading, even these chains can get expensive because at the end of the day, they would have to roll up their data in batch to the main Ethereum network. So even that gets expensive. And then the another issue is since these towns or these uh, um, satellite towns have their own thing going on and they just talk with the main Ethereum city, they don't talk with each other. So there's an interoperability issue as well. So if something is going on on Optimism mainnet, Arbitrum mainnet, or Arbitrum 1 mainnet would not know about that. So there's an ongoing interoperability issue as well. So at this point, the demand of uh, node operators or node as a service started to increase even more, even further, because, the, because of the number of chains and because of your requirement or necessity to get the main Ethereum chains data as well as these side chains and rollups' data as well. And uh, not just node providers, but even indexers starting to started to see uh, a lot of uh, traction during this time. Indexers in terms of covalent um, graph protocol. I mean, graph protocol is not exactly an indexer, indexer, but it is kind of an indexer where you have indexed data and you can access that indexed data using GraphQL. So all of these started gaining a lot of traction during this point. But as I mentioned earlier, even this started to get saturated. Even this started to get uh, um, overwhelmed as the, as the use cases of blockchain technology started to come more into mainstream where the frequency of transactions was very much high. So we will talk about the solution for that. But before that, what happened in the timeline is um, Ethereum merge happened. So these roll-up solutions and these uh, uh, sidechain solutions were, and even plasmas were uh, looked as a temporary and makeshift solutions until the main Ethereum chain scales. But uh, the thing is, even after merge, like, uh, and that was not intended from the Ethereum Foundation as well, that uh, the main chain cannot scale that much to occupy or to cater to the 
uh, mainstream solutions like gaming and high frequency trading, etc. These are just examples, but I'm saying that uh, the main, uh, main chain cannot scale that much where it can handle all the traffic. So that's why we have uh, modular blockchains right now. Well, we will talk about them later. But what happened in Merge is that uh, we, are, we are going in the timeline, like how we came to where we are today from the earlier days. So in Merge, we went from the older or the original consensus mechanism, which was proof of work, to proof of stake, where the miners had to leave and validators had to come. And uh, because of the merge, the energy consumption of the entire Ethereum blockchain as a network went down. And uh, then a lot of people started to get more opportunities. It opened, up, uh, it opened up gates for more possibilities of participation as anyone could stake their ETH and become a validator. And like compared to earlier where you needed very much high-end uh, hardware, etc. So we talked about uh, issues or saturation of the layer twos, right? How even that started to get overwhelmed. So then the solution, I mean, this is not an official term, but people like to call them layer threes, which is one more layer on top of the second layer of the Ethereum network or ecosystem is, I guess, the better word. So now you might wonder that why does this Ethereum or this um, Ethereum ecosystem has more layers than uh, 10 years birthday cake. So the thing is that each layer serves its own purpose. So layer three is not like layer two where it's a completely different layer on top of the main chain where just uh, the proof of the Ethereum chain or the state of the Ethereum chain is stored on the main chain or the batch transactions are stored on the main chain. But layer three serves different pur uh, purposes. Some layer threes can be just an uh, interoperability layer where it can be used to access data from other layer twos. And some layer threes can be a uh, actual layer on top of a layer two where it uses, for example, Xi uh, Network, which was just launched last, uh, if I'm not wrong, within last uh, weeks or last few weeks. It, uh, XAI, XAI Shy Network, it is a layer three built on top of the Arbitrum, uh, Arbitrum network. So it uses the Arbitrum's optimistic layer technology and create and, ha and it ha they have created a specialized chain, but just for gaming, because, so that it can serve high frequency gaming transactions. They have made transactions cheaper. And uh, how they do is that they use the they use the arbitrum rollup technology arbitrum optimistic rollup technology to make the execution faster and then another thing is that they have used is data uh, data availability layer where arbitrum has this uh, anitrust layer using which they anyone can form a data uh, availability committee for example you delegate two to three, or I'm just giving an example, but data committee can be a uh, delegation of uh, data availability to some providers where you, what you can do is you can have these delegated person and whenever that data needs to be fetched, for let's say that you want to fetch data about a particular transaction which happened a month ago or 10,000 blocks ago. So what you can do is instead of uh, querying the actual blockchain, you can query these data availability providers and get the data back. So this makes the trans uh, this makes the operations cheaper and faster because you don't need to store the actual data on the blockchain where in layer twos it was stored on layer twos. Just the proof of uh, just the batching of those transactions was stored on layer one, but in in this kind of layer two, what you can do is you can store the data off chain and just store the proof of that data or verification of that data on the main chain. So that's what uh, layer three does. They further make the chains more scalable and more efficient and serves a specific use case. It can be interoperability, it can be a specific use case like gaming, etc. So with layer three, the term modularity or modular blockchain became more prominent, more uh, popular, because uh, 
we started separating these uh, different operations of blockchain and started doing them on different layers. For example, execution on different layer, consensus on different layer, settlement on different layer, and data availability on different layer. Execution is, again, your uh, transaction execution. Consensus in terms of uh, L2 and L1 is cons your consensus layer will be Ethereum, and your execution layer will be your layer two. And then data availability, as I talked earlier, can be a committee or can be a provider like e uh, EigenDA, Avail, Celestia, etc. So a lot of uh, a lot of people would have also seen uh, another layer in the modular blockchain stack or in the modular Ethereum blockchain stack, which is called settlement. So in that case, what happens is execution happens on one layer, then Settlement happens on another layer. So settlements layer can be your fraud proof or fraud verification layer where your transactions happen on one layer, but the transactions are proved or verified on another layer. And then in consensus layer, the data of those transactions can be stored so that it's more secure, just like how data is stored or rolled up on the Ethereum chain. And just the proofs of everything happening on chain are stored on this layer, and the actual data, for example, what was the transaction about, which uh, contract it interacted with, what were the opt codes, what were the, uh, what were the parameters which was the transaction sent with, all of that is stored on the data availability layer. So it's, it becomes even further cheaper and even more uh, optimized and efficient. And uh, with modularity and with the layer threes, a lot of uh, new chain creation frameworks started coming in where people can just uh, use any of these SDKs or chain creation frameworks, or they are even called rollup as a service if you want to create a chain with a particular rollup. So they started getting more popularity where you could just use these frameworks or SDKs to create your own chain. They are just like uh, how you can use hard hat or you can, use, you can use create React app to create your React app, right? You do not have to uh, get each and every library yourself. You do not have to worry about, okay, what library I should use for server-side interaction or what library I should use for CSS, etc. Everything is there within that bundle and you can just uh, use that and start getting started and start with your new chain or launch your new chain very quickly. So some of the examples for these are OPStack, Arbitrum Orbits, ZK Stack, Polygon CDK. With OPStack and Arbitrum Orbits, you can launch your own optimistic rollup chains pretty quickly. They have a framework or a bunch of tools, like a toolkit, and you can use them to launch your own chain. As For example, Zychain, they just launched their uh, layer three chain based on Arbitrum using Arbitrum uh, orbits. And then ZK stack and Polygon CDK helps you launch your own ZK EVM based chains pretty quickly. So because of this, a lot of uh, new type of infrastructure providers started coming into the space like CoinDuit, Gelato Network. Gelato was all, have already been there, but they have moved their operations to roll up as a service provider. So uh, because of this advancements, new rollup as a service provider started coming into the space where uh, even QuickNote does that. So where our infrastructure provider provides a infrastructure or nodes for that particular small network and they even run sequences for them, even provide uh, block explorers for them, etc. So that's where we are today, where a lot of new chains are being launched and can be launched using these chain frameworks or roll-up as a service frameworks. And in the future, I think this is going to be even further easier where even a non-native Web3 user or even a non-technical person can just go into a user interface, click few buttons and launch their own chains. That's even possible today to some extent with Arbitrum Orbits that you can just enter your name, you can just enter how many nodes you want, you can just enter what kind of uh, uh, data availability layer you want, and then deploy your own chain. They'll give you a Docker container, and then you just have to deploy that Docker container. It's that simple. So 
this is uh, this is going to get even more simpler in the coming time. So yeah, that's uh, that's my time, I guess. So we saw that uh, how we came from just being nodes where people used to access data from a single Ethereum blockchain to these modular blockchains where there are so many layers for each type of functionality and it's become even more easier to launch your own blockchain. Earlier it was difficult to get data from a particular chain but now it's so easy to even launch a blockchain. So yeah, that's my time. Thank you everyone.